Good morning. Welcome to the Shepherd's Word Church and welcome back to this study of Our Shepherd's Word. And I do so love that song, Amazing Grace. It's uh, what we love to open with uh, because it's a song that has a greater impact and influence on more people in this world than any other song or any other music affected more people. And, and the true amazing grace of our Heavenly Father has had the greatest impact of anything in people's lives. It is at work today. It has always been at work with us. It has always been with us, that beautiful, amazing grace. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do love you, Lord. And as we come together, Father, and seek to learn more about what does your word actually say, we look to you, Father, as our teacher to teach us, lead us, and Father, I ask for a special blessing on all those who give of themselves to, to help this church and help this word continue to go out, as you have said, to, to bring, bring into, this, into your house and that you would open the windows and pour out the blessings of heaven upon all those who seek to give and keep your word coming to them, that meat that needs to be taught. And Father, I ask that, that you remember especially my, my brother Jack. He is a tower of faith, always is. And, and of course, uh, remember my, my little brother uh, Perry that, that he gives of himself. And of course, all those here, Lord, that give of their time to the church, that uh, Jim and, and Trey, we thank you so much, Lord, for all those who give to your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for all these things. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So as we return back to this book that is the seed plot on which all teachings are built upon, and we're going to see today that there is another teaching that the, that the Lord makes known to us. And in the beginning, God teaches us that we must stand up against and destroy the wickedness uh, and when it comes into the land if we fail to diligently make battle against that wickedness and destroy it and remove this wickedness then we will see bad things happen to good and innocent people so the Lord he's assured us that Ultimately, he is going to totally destroy all wickedness and all wickedness from amongst us. That day is soon to come. But he also teaches us, or commands us, I should say, that we are to share this teaching and teach others of this truth, to teach it to every generation that that is coming. And the way we teach it as he told Joshua and told Moses and teaches us that we are to stand up against and destroy this wickedness among us and that is with capital punishment and if we don't then it's going to be amongst us as he had said do, to, to destroy those who commit murder who just uh, commit rape to kill them to put them to death, and that's not murder, that's death, that's execution, and that is commanded by God. 
And he said, if you do, my, do it, what I tell you, then these things will cease to be among you. But of course, as we see today, so much wickedness is increasing amongst us. And nobody is standing up. Now, it is a spiritual battle that we must change the hearts and minds of all those around us. That they must know that this must be taught. So that's what the Lord is going to show us today. And as I said, this book of In the Beginning, that it, this is a, one of those beginnings that God will teach us of these things. Now, as we reach, uh, we're going to uh, pick back up uh, with actually with chapter 34 uh, in Genesis, but there's a couple verses that I wanted to go back to in uh, chapter 33. And I wanted to pick it up with uh, verse 18 and reread these verses. And of course, this is at a point where Jacob has healed the relationship between himself and his brother Esau, who had said that he wanted to kill him. And of course, we will see times through the generations that they that these brothers would get along. The the uh, children of Esau, which would be Edom, the red nation, and also uh, those of Jacob, those of Israel, that we, would, we will have times that the brothers get along, but for the greatest part of history, there is contention amongst the brothers, opposition amongst the brothers. But at this point in history, they will get along until after the death of their father. They will come together to bury their father. So, uh, and of course, uh, uh, so Jacob is uh, going to move, move ahead and come into, into the land, back into the land that will one day be known in that part of history as Israel. And Jacob came to Shalem, and that means uh, peaceful, a city of Shechem. And of course, listen to that name, Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan when he came from Padal and Ram and pitched his tent before the city. Now, of course, this was a mistake. You remember, this is what Lot did, how he, uh, when he left uh, Abraham, departed from him, that he went and pitched his tent right there at the gates of the city. And, of course, that was Sodom and Gomorrah. But as we will read, there is great wickedness in all this land of Canaan of all these descendants of Ham, great wickedness. So this was a mistake. There's plenty of land elsewhere, plenty of water elsewhere to, to feed the sheep, but he chose to bring his family and all of his goods right here before this city. 19, and he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money and as I said we'll we'll learn more about this it will be it is in his inheritance to his uh, the sons of Joseph this uh, piece of land that he bought and he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel and that as I said that that meaning God the God of Israel that being his God our God 34 and Dina, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And of course, Jacob did have other daughters. We will read that in another place. That he uh, his which mentions his sons and his daughters. He he did have other daughters, but Dina is the only daughter that is mentioned by name, and for this special purpose that God teaches us here. And of course, she's, so she's going into the city to see the other girls. Now, at this point in time, Dina is 13 years old. And, you know, her brothers, most of her brothers are young also. At this point in time, Reuben would be about 19 years old, the oldest. Simeon uh, would be about 18. And Simeon and Levi uh, are her true uh, brothers, where the other brothers, you would call them half brothers, uh, brothers by a different mother. So, and so Simeon being about 18, and Levi about 17, Dan 17, Judah 16, Naphtali 16, Gad 15, Asher 14, Ishakar 14, Zebulun 13, and Joseph 13. 
And as I said, Dina also 13 years old. So this 13 year old girl decides to go and see the other girls in the land. And so she goes into the city. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, you see that the land is called Shechem and this, and this, and this one's name is Shechem. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, now the Hivites, they are descended uh, from Ham through Canaan, and God mentions them in numerous places that they, along with many others, the Perizzites and, and uh, others, that they had mixed with the fallen angels, they had mixed with the sons of Cain, and they were a people of great wickedness. So this was a mistake for Jacob to bring his family here. To where the Hivites are. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. This is a forcible taking. He kidnapped her, he raped her, and he defiled her. This is a crushing thing for a 13 year old girl. And all through history, the value that that God placed in a woman being able to bring to the relationship uh, with that one that would be her husband, that you know that that uh, great dowry, as the Lord calls it, of virginity, that is taken away. And and in this time, it was much harder than it is today. You know that's pretty well been destroyed since the 60s. You know that so uh, virginity is almost looked upon as a curse in our time. But you know it is of great value if a young couple could bring, bring, their, bring that to the table when they come with a marriage to one another. So, but he, as I said, this is a forcible taking, a forcible rape, and just literally crushed her. And his soul clave unto Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. Now, we hear stories about this. It's quite common that after somebody uh, kidnaps a woman and rapes her, and then all of a sudden they want to speak kind to her and pretend that they are their, her, her little savior or friend or something like that. And this is just what this one is doing, that Shechem is doing. Now, all of a sudden, he's speaking kindly to her, but she's still being held. She did not get to go back home. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dina, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. Now, of course, that would be a hard thing to do, and maybe that was the wisest thing to do. You know, because at that time, uh, they had not invented the cult at that point in time. And uh, so Jacob, I mean, he's getting up in years, and, and uh, so he, he, he held his peace until his sons were come, in, come back from the field. And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel, in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. And that's exactly right, ought not to be done, because this is that protected seed line that God had set aside and protected, because through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and these uh, 12 sons, uh, the house of Israel would come the Lord himself. So it was to be protected. This thing ought not to be done. And they were angry and rightfully so. And Hamor communed with them saying, the soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her to him to wife. Nine, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. Now that's something that God has highly uh, taught to uh, all of his children. Do not make marriages with those of that land. State, do not take daughters of them. And of course, that's uh, 
where Esau went went bad because he took daughters of that land, daughters of the of the Canaanites and the Hivites, and so that that removed him from any possibility of that seed line. But Jacob, uh, of course, he knew that, and of course he had taught his sons; they knew that that this was not going to happen. And but uh, Hamor continues, and he said, "Ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get ye possessions therein." Now, of course, uh, Jacob's the one with the possessions. He's a very rich man, blessed by God, and uh, the uh, those of the city they're eyeing it, and of course they want to rip him off, want to rape rape his daughters, and and take everything he's got. And Shechem said unto her father and to, unto her brethren, so this is, this is the rapist, let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as you shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. So any amount of money, it doesn't matter that he wants to buy her. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem, and Hamor, his father, deceitfully. Now, I'd say covertly. because This is covert action. They're thinking very wise, deceitfully, and said because he had defiled Dina, their sister. And they said unto him, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. And... So I want to read one more verse. But in this will we consent unto you, if you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised. And I want to go back and show you a little bit about, about the land and about the teaching. And uh, Jim, I think I, I jumped way ahead. But I want to go back and look at what's really going on in the land that they are dealing with. Let's go back to Genesis uh, uh, chapter 9, and because uh, I do want to look at these laws of God. Genesis chapter 9 and verse, verse 6. The Lord teaches us, he says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So what God is teaching is that there is to be the death penalty. That if somebody murders uh, one of his children, they are to be killed. They are to be executed. So that is a righteous killing. That is not uh, murder. That is killing. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 18. And I want to read uh, verses 20 through 30. Now, this is uh, all through this chapter. The Lord is showing us things that were going on in the land of that, they, that these have come into. That uh, he's saying, don't do what these of the land are doing. And of course, uh, I'm skipping over where he teaches a lot about not to have, you know, family relationships with close kin or to lay with with any of your kin or, or their wives. But I'm going to pick it up with verse 20. He says, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. You don't do that. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. And of course, this means don't uh, sacrifice your children to Molech. And that, that, and that was one of the things that the people of the land were doing, that they would uh, actually burn their children in the fire as a sacrifice to, to their God, Molech. He says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination, and that is homosexuality. Don't do that. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defy thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. And, of course, that is, he'll tell us, that was going on in the land. Great wickedness. Defile not yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. He, but he said, this is what those nations are doing. 
and the land is defiled. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled, that the land spewed not you out also when you defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. And that, uh, that as God said, uh, they were to do away with these people, to cleanse the land, and uh, because that is the teaching that this is the ultimate uh, cleansing of God. That's a picture of that ultimate cleansing of God, that all that wickedness will be done away with. Let's look at uh, Numbers, uh, no, actually uh, Leviticus uh, uh, 24, yeah, and verse 17. I want to read verse 17. And we read, And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And so that's another place where we're documenting that. And, and there's many words, or actually I should say there's uh, uh, several words that are, com are uh, translated as to kill. And some actually do mean to murder. And uh, let me take a look. Uh, for instance, uh, naka. Now this is like a vicious kind of, of murder that uh, that is translated uh, to it's some, most of the time is just translated as to kill but it means to murder and ratzak now this is another uh, violent uh, type of killing a murder now like muth it means to kill and that can be a righteous killing execution or in defense of your nation um, you know where we are taught to defend our families, to defend our nation. If you have an enemy that wants to kill you and all those of your family and all of your nation, you're supposed to send them to the Father, execute them, send them to the Father. And so that is righteous. And the same same thing that uh, as God teaches us that we, uh, we are to use capital punishment. You know, sadly, we see those who pretend to be Christians that do not have the word that will go to, say, an execution where somebody who has raped and murdered, like in Dina's case, a 13-year-old girl, and they will light candles and sing songs and do all they can to interrupt that in opposition to the word of God. But they're claiming they're Christians, claiming they're Christ men, but they are not. They do not have God's word. So let's, let's continue. I want to go to Numbers chapter 35. And in Numbers uh, chapter 35, I'm going to read verses 11 through 25 and then 30 and 31. And um, we read, Then you shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person at unawares. Now this is where one of the places where God goes to great lengths to begin to teach us that there is a difference between murder and killing. And because what he's teaching here, like, it happened accidentally. I didn't mean to kill somebody. It, it was an accident. But no matter, every time somebody passes away, generally the family feels it's somebody's fault. You know, uh, if he hadn't have been doing this, that wouldn't have happened. If the doctors would have done that, that wouldn't have happened. So it's always somebody's fault. You know, uh, uh, suing suing companies and whatnot uh, because they caught a disease. Like I say, it's always somebody's fault. And so God's aware of this. That even though there there may be an accidental death, the family wants to take vengeance. And so God has said, "You'll make uh, cities a refuge for those to flee to until there can be a hearing. In other words, a hearing, a court hearing amongst uh, the the uh, brethren to find out if he's guilty or not." He says that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person at unawares, and they shall be unto you cities for refuge 
from the avenger that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. So he needs to have his day to be heard. And of these cities which ye shall give, six cities shall ye have for refuge, and shall give three cities on this side, Jordan, and three cities ye give in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be a refuge both for the children of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that everyone that killeth any person unawares may flee thither. So it didn't matter if you were of Israel, you were a stranger passing through the land, uh, everyone had to write to a fair trial. And if he smite with him with it and, and if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. That was intended. That's lay in wait. That's murder. The murderer shall surely be put to death, not taken to the altar to try to get him saved, not to be given time in jail and a slap on the hand, put to death. And if he smite him with throwing a stone wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with an hand weapon of wood wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. And so that means the next of kin that has the right to actually pull the switch. But if he thrust him of hatred or hurt at him by laying of weight that he die, and that, that means he planned it, he wanted to hurt him, or in enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, for he is a murderer. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. But if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or have cast upon him anything without laying of weight, and that means it, an argument broke out into a fight, and uh, you didn't, you weren't planning to hurt him, you weren't planning to kill him, but things got out of hand, or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not and cast it upon him that he die and was not his enemy neither sought his harm he had no intention of hurting him but things got out of hand it, it happens then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments so everybody's going the congregation is going to get together just like a court and listen to the facts and make a judgment you know, uh, maybe, maybe it was self-defense. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whether he was fled, and he shall abide in it until the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. So the reason uh, they're, they're, uh, he may have to, even though he may be found innocent, his return to the city of refuge. And this is because the family's still not going to accept it, that there's going to be hard feelings like, well, dad's no longer with us to provide for. So in this case, this one is actually taken out of circulation also. And it's, it is uh, so that, uh, and it's to the time of the death of the high priest, because nobody knows how long that other person would have lived anyway. And so at the death of the high priest, that's just a marking point that he probably wouldn't, maybe he wouldn't live beyond that, and he goes back home. Now, of course, that doesn't guarantee, but that the family, somebody of the family may still hold him responsible, but hopefully by that time, uh, things would have cooled down that they've learned to live with it. I'm going to go to verse 30. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses, but one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. So as God's going to say, it takes two witnesses. Now, uh, that's if all you have is one person and no evidence, then that's not enough. If you have two eyewitnesses, that's enough. Because sometimes one person may think they saw something and didn't. So God says there should be two witnesses. Now, if there is a witness and there is overwhelming circumstantial evidence then that's two witnesses it says moreover 
You shall take no satisfaction for the life of the murderer. Now what this means is you will uh, not redeem him. And that is try to uh, uh, pay. It can, it can mean to try to buy him out of it, to redeem him out of it. Or even a spiritual redemption. If he is a murderer, God never says, now take him directly to the altar and get him saved. And then we'll talk about possible capital punishment. He never says that. Take him directly and put him to death. So take no satisfaction, no redemption for the life of the murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. And Hunt also, now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. And this deals uh, with uh, the rape, like what happened to, in the case similar to Dina. And we have many cases of possible rapes and, and whatnot, but this, one, this is the one that I, I want to share with you t today. He's, and the Lord teaches, but if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy for death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. In the case that the damsel uh, because there, there are cases where they were caught, a couple may have been caught in adultery, uh, that act, and if, uh, if a woman was out where there was no one to help her, then just a man was guilty. But if they found a man uh, uh, with, a, with a, another man's wife in the city, but she didn't cry out, then they planned it. And uh, they were both to be put to death for, for that action of adultery, lying with another man's wife. But in this case, because like Dina, there was nobody to cry out to. She was taken captive in this city. Her family could not hear her cries of help. So this is the same thing. And what God is saying, as it's just as when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him. So it's just like murder, the same thing as murder. Even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So God likens that just as murder, a violent murder. So let's turn back to, to Genesis uh, chapter 34 again. And Jim, uh, I know I bounced you around there a little bit. So... So we uh, pick back up uh, with the, uh, the sons of Jacob uh, in this conversation with Shechem and Hamor. And I'm going I'm to pick it up again, Jim, with uh, verse 15. They said, But in this will we consent unto you, if you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised. Then, we, then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. Now, of course, as uh, we have read, this is deceitful. This is covert action. There's a whole city. I mean, they've got an army of males over there. And all we have are these, these young men. And uh, because, uh, as I said, that uh, the only ones that... Uh, the only ones that uh, are of, of age, you know, you say from 17 up, would be like Dan, Levi, and Simeon, and Reuben. The others, I mean, they were, they were still young, young themselves. They were out in the field uh, keeping the sheep, but not battle ready. And, but when a young man is 17, he's, he's 17, 18 years old, he's, he's battle ready. And so this is deceitful because this is not going to happen. They would never let this happen, that they would become one people. This is the tribe of Israel, the family from which the Christ would come. And they continue, but if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son, and the young man deferred not to do the thing. He, he agreed to it because he had delight in Jacob's daughter 
and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. Now this tells you something about that city. This kidnapping rapist is the most honorable of the whole bunch because all those things that we read that was going on in the land, that's going on in this city. So he's more honorable than all the, all the house of his father, this kidnapping rapist. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came unto the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us, speaking of Jacob and, and his families. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade therein for the land. Behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives and let us give them our daughters. Just what God tells, told them, don't let this happen. Only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us to be one people. If every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised, we're all going to have to be circumcised. Now, now listen to this. This is the real goal of all of them. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? We can rip them off. We can rape their daughters. We can rip off all their goods. Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. And unto Hamor and to Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city, and every male was circumcised all that went out of the gate of his city. So they all looked out there at how rich Abraham was, all the goods he had, and the beauty, and the beauty of his uh, family. And yeah, we'll do that, because they intend to rip him off. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that two of, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brethren, these are our two full brothers, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And this word sore, it, um, it can mean uh, not just sore, but like an inflamed, uh, grievous, painful sore and so there's a such thing as unclean instruments that within three days uh, if a man has uh, inflammation in that part his legs aren't even going to want to work he's not going to be able to get up and so this is the hand of God at work and we don't read that that Jacob came or that Reuben came only two brothers came and slew all the men and you know I first thought about that and like I wouldn't want my daughter come and say well, like where were you at you know like why didn't you come get me but then I thought about it because this is the hand of God at work I mean these guys they did not have AK-47s they didn't have grenades they each had a sword and they had God with them and they walked in and killed every male in the city. So the rest of the land's going to see this. And so that's the reason that they would fear God. They came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they sl slew Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword. And took Dina out of Shechem's house and went out. She was still there being held captive. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. And this means all the sons. So they all pitched in in cleaning them out. The same way they wanted to clean out Jacob's uh, house, they, they took everything they had. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. They didn't leave nothing behind. And of course they took, the, they did not kill the, 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 what, the women or the children, but they did take them and they would probably be servants for some time. But looking at it in the picture that at least they would have, these would have the opportunity to hopefully know the true God, to, to know the word of God and be away from all the horrible corruption that was going on because uh, if they would treat Dina that way, they treated all the women that way. So this was hope for those that were taken uh, by these, uh, and, as, and as I said, probably as at first as servants, but you know they, uh, they could become uh, 
you know, better people and hopefully have a life. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And of course, Jacob, uh, he's getting up in years and he's always worried. It seems uh, that uh, he wouldn't be able to protect his family. Now, in this case, Jacob's wrong. These boys, if I, if I could meet them in heaven, I'd shake their hand and pat them on the back and say, well done, you did good. Uh, but uh, Jacob, he's looking at it differently. And, you know, maybe God put that spirit in him because he, he didn't want uh, any of the other brothers or Jacob to take part in that. It was just he and, and those two brothers. But Jacob says, I being in few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed. I and my house, all of our family all will be destroyed by the people of the land. They're going to be angry about this and come, come uh, destroy us. We don't want to look at things that way. We need to have faith in God and take a stand against the wickedness, even if it's just words that making it known that this is wrong. Um, you know, right now in, the, in this day and time, as I said, it seems like most uh, men uh, are as the description of being stung by the scorpion, where a scorpion's victim, its backbone melts and uh, becomes the stomach of uh, it's uh, of the of the scorpion, and that's how so many men are today. They will not stand up for the wickedness that they see going on. They don't want to say anything or do anything. You see what's happening all throughout our nation, even in our government. Nobody standing up. And when they said, and this is the the answer, how they would answer their father, and they said, should he deal with our sister as with a harlot? They were right. And, you know, I, I think back and, uh, you know, as growing, growing up and the man that my father was. And, but as time went on, you know, got up in years, he kind of followed a political party that had become very liberal. And his ways became liberal. And he and I would get in some heated discussions. And uh, I remember one time we were in the truck and coming back from a trip. And, and uh, it got pretty hot because... I was more conservative, and, and it got real quiet, and then he looked over at me and says, you know, um, just because I'm dad, I may not always be right, but as I've told you before probably that we never talked politics again after that. But, you know, this, the, it happens sometimes in families, and, and we can, maybe we uh, see that little bit of weakness in Jacob here. And God said, and this is chapter 35, and God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, that's the house of God, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And so this is to actually restore courage back and hope back into Jacob. Because yes, he is concerned about what has just happened. But this is where God encouraged him against his brother Esau that I will be with you. So he's saying, go back there. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. And yes, they had gone through and cleaned out the houses of all these Canaanites and Hivites. And sure, I'm sure they were gold. They took it for the gold, but they were in the images of strange gods. And Jacob saying, get rid of them. Let's get rid of everything and change your garments. And that means... To be spiritually clean is what that's alluding to, to, to put on that gospel armor. Prepare, let's be prepared with that gospel armor. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, that house of God, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. So going right back there where God first met with him and promised he'd be with him. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. You know, if you had a metal detector today and could find that, there's a mother load there. Nobody has ever mentioned finding that. And they journeyed. This is important. 
Verse 5, And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. You bet they didn't. After what they had just seen that God had done with two young men, 17 and 18 years old, they did not pursue after them. So Jacob's fears were alleviated. But it's so important that we realize that just how destructive this sin that we see going on today that has entered in teaching it in our schools, teaching it in our colleges, how it's entered into our government, that we must stand up for what is right. At least we may not change laws because things are going to get more and more wicked as time goes on. That uh, as the Lord says, they're calling good wicked and wicked good. And so we're up against that. But we may pull some out of the fire by teaching this and demanding and teaching that God demands that death penalty. How wrong these things are. Let us pray and give praise to our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, we truly do love you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you are our teacher. That as we open this book and read these pages, that, that you would open our eyes and open our ears and give us understanding to know more about what does your word actually teach us. What does it actually say? We thank you, Lord, that you do this. And Father, as we learn these things, and we pray that it will go out and touch many hearts, we Father, we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Thank you, brother.